So thanks very much for coming to listen to a science talk in the middle of the week. Uh, you do get some cocktails and jazz to go with it at least, so hopefully it's going to be palatable. And because it's Halloween, when they asked me what I should speak about, I suggested uh, ghost imagery. I don't think I'm going to be able to get the pointer across to that side, but I will try to keep you engaged. Okay. So, so ghost imaging doesn't have anything to do with ghosts. So if you came here hoping for a, a spectral... Yes, I know. <laughs> very disappointing. Maybe in the future we can try to do that. But for now, I'm going to show you a spooky type of imaging that doesn't have anything per se to do with ghosts, but is spooky nevertheless. And before we go into the ghost imaging, it's always good to take a step back and first look at what is conventional imaging. So everybody in the room, of course, has taken many photographs, perhaps not with a normal camera anymore, but with your cell phone, your smartphone, but you certainly have taken many photographs. And so you know very well that you have to point the detector at some object that you'd like to take an image of, the object has to have either emitting it, some light itself or there has to be a light source like a flash perhaps you know, or, or a, a light like this that illuminates the object. And then light comes from the object towards your detector, in this case the camera. So unlike what they thought many centuries ago, your eye, for example, does not send out little tentacles to the thing that you want to see. It's photons that come from the object to your eye. And likewise with the camera, so the light comes into the detector, in this case a camera. And if you want to take an image of something and project it onto a two-dimensional plane, like a, a screen, like this uh, display that you see here, then of course you need a two-dimensional detector that has resolution to see the thing you want to see. So in this particular picture, which is just a standard way of looking at imaging, you see that the detector's got a two-dimensional array that collects all the lights, and so you form an object, um, an image of the object that's at some distance away. So that's very straightforward, but we can put it on a more physical footing <clears throat> and go into the detector, the camera itself, and see what does it actually do. Now cameras, even your smartphone actually, have many, many lenses but I'm not going to look at it in a complicated practical sense. I'm going to break it, you know, physicists never do anything practical. So we like to make the world as simple as possible. So rather than all the complicated lenses that you see in cameras, including your smartphone actually, we're going to reduce it down. That wasn't me. Um, <laughs> we're going to reduce it down just to one simple lens. The physics doesn't change and the fact that we have more lenses actually in our cameras these days is simply to improve the quality of the image. But the physics is the same. So why is it that if we have an object at some distance and we have a, a lens that we can form an image? So if you look at the, the slides, it's, if you have ever done first year physics, you'll know that we like to draw objects as arrows for some reason, I don't know why. Uh, so we have an object that's depicted by this arrow that's pointing upwards, and here we have a lens, and we hope to form an image some distance after the lens. So you can imagine that this is the screen, or it's the detector of your camera, and we hope to see this over there. So how is it that it works? <clears throat> well, in a technical sense, we say it works by position correlations. So what do we mean by that in simple English? So what we mean is the following. So if you look at say, a ray of light, so imagine light being like an arrow that leaves the object. Well, it's possible that the, that the light went horizontal and then it hits the lens, and the action of the lens actually is to bring it down to this point. It's also possible that you know, the light went at some other angle, for example, through the center of the lens, and it turns out, if you do the ray tracing, that again, the lens maps that line to this point. In fact, it turns out that it doesn't matter at what angle the light leaves that point of the object. It always arrives at that point in the image. And that's what we mean by a position correlation. We mean that regardless of the path that the ray takes, all points here map to a point there. So this point is correlated with this point. But notice that it only works at that particular plane, 
at this image plane, which I won't be able to get over here, right? So only at that image plane. If I were to move a little bit away from this plane, let's say I drew an imaginary line here, then one point on the object maps to three points on the image. So in that case, we would say that we do not have position correlations. Now, we actually have words for this in simple English, right? So if I go back to the image I showed you before, if the object and the image plane have these position correlations, then we say that the image is sharp. We have a really sharp, clear image of the object. And that you can see in this camera with what it's looking at is, is nicely in focus. But if I move away from the image plane, where one point mapped to many, then we just say it's blurry. So lacking position correlations means blurry. And if you look far away, so you cannot have two planes having the same position correlations, well then this one, if it's sharp, then far away it will be a bit blurry. So what's happening here is that we can form images of objects by choosing the optical system to set up these correlations for us. They don't happen naturally, but we can set the optical system to do it for us. Now that's conventional imaging, and what we want to do is we want to set it up in a different way. So we want to go back to this, this very simple first year physics question, and something we do a lot in our group is we say to ourselves, what is it that we're assuming in this picture? What is it that we take for granted that it must be so that we could possibly question and say, is it really necessary for it to be that way? So the first thing that we're assuming is that the object, as I told you, sends light from the object to the image. That seems self-evident. If I want to form an image of something over there, then light must travel from the object to the image. <clears throat> the second thing that we're assuming is that if I want to take a high-resolution image of some object that I'm going to display on a 2D screen, for example, like my computer screen, or photographic film, if anybody ever uses that anymore, then if it's two dimensions in the thing that I want to look at, then I need two dimensions in my detector. And so that's why your cameras today would have millions of pixels, little detectors that, that look for these position correlations and collect light. And of course, you know that the more pixels you have in your camera, the better the image that you're going to get of this object. And so you need lots of pixels. You have to have what we would call spatial resolution. You need lots and lots of pixels to resolve the thing very nicely that you want to see. And what I want to show you in this talk, that these two things that seem obvious, you must get light from the object to the image, and you have to have the same resolution in your detector as what you want to see in real life, that we're going to actually remove both of those criteria. Okay. It's not going to be necessary. So how can we do that? So we certainly can't do it by sticking to the usual rules of physics. And so we're going to go to the quantum world, and we're going to try to play with all the quantum quirkiness that we know in the world. I don't know how many people have studied quantum physics before. I see with some alarm that my students also didn't put their hands up. <coughs> Well, Einstein hated the idea that was inherent in quantum mechanics. And I'm going to give you the popular science version of quantum mechanics, but if you buy me cocktails afterwards, I'll explain it in more detail. Right? So Schrodinger gave, it, gave the story like this. Imagine that there's a box, and inside the box there's a cat. And unfortunately for the cat, this box has got a little poisonous uh, vial that's should uh, it has a 50-50 probability that the poison is released or it's not released. Now, in our everyday lives, in such a situation, we would say, well, if the box is closed up and I say to you, what do you think is the state of the cat? You say, well, it's 50% chance the cat is dead, and there's a 50% chance the cat is alive. Uh, we just have to open the box to find out which it is. And the quantum world says, no, that's not actually how it works. The quantum world says, in fact, the cat is in a state that's both dead 
and alive at the same time. And it only collapses to one of those outcomes when you make a measurement, which is to look into the box and, you know, prod the irritated cat at this point. <clears throat> only at that point is the cat, you know, into a state of dead or alive. But before that, it's an and. It's a plus. So the cat is both dead and alive. Now, if, if that doesn't sound very surprising to you, it means that we need to talk about it a little bit more, okay? Because that goes against all the rules that we see in the, in the world around us. Everything in the world around us has some reality to it. We believe that the moon is there regardless of whether we're looking at it or not. But this world says that that's not quite how it works. So, of course, we don't want to do experiments with cats. They're hard to deal with and the SPCA would not be very happy. And so we deal with photons. So in my lab, we deal with photons. And so we want to create a quantum world and try out these tricks with lights. So photons are particles of light. And so to do that, we only need to have three things, three essential steps. So the first step is that we need to create some photons that have this crazy cat property. And this cat property, we have a name for it, we call it entanglement. So it's called quantum entanglement, and the, the idea of entanglement means that these two realities are somehow mixed together, and there's no fixed reality that we can pin our hopes on that this is how the world really works. So we need to create photons that are entangled. Then we need to perform some measurements on these photons, and for the moment I'm going to split the measurement into two parts. So the one is I'm going to operate on the photons, so in the cat's case, I want to do something that will change the state of the cat, like maybe you know, break the poison or not break it or do something that alters the state. So we're going to, to do that to our light. And then finally, we're going to collect the light and see what happens. So those are the three things that we need in order to do a quantum experiment. So the first part is not so difficult. Actually, all we need is a fancy piece of glass it uh, has some non-linear properties. This just means that it doesn't work the same way as ordinary glass. And in particular, it has a very nice property that if I bring in an ultraviolet photon, so I bring in some ultraviolet light, then uh, if I bring one photon in to this glass, I get two photons out at a different wavelength. In fact, they go into the infrared. And this is the essential ingredient to create entangled lights. And how, how do I know it's going to be entangled, and how does this process actually work? Well, the details I'm going to show you in a slide to come. The one thing I like to tell people is that it's a terribly inefficient process. So imagine this is the crystal now in a cartoon form, this little yellow block, and I have these ultraviolet photons, as I showed you in the previous picture, coming into it. And I say, you know, each pulse from a laser beam would have billions and billions and billions of photons. And I say, well, how often do you think... I get two photons out like I showed you in the animation before. Well, it turns out that if you have billions and billions of photons per pulse, on average, you get zero entangled photons. <laughs> okay? This is why you need a very patient student, as Isaac and Bienvenue will tell you, to sit in the lab and wait for these photons to come. Or, if you don't have patient students, then you need to have a laser that generates lots and lots of photons at a very, very high repetition rate. So our laser, actually in our lab now, runs continuously. In our previous experiments, would run at about 100 uh, million hertz, so 100 million pulses per second, each one with a billion photons, and with that would get a few thousand of these pairs of photons um, every second. Right, so... How do I know that this piece of nonlinear glass is going to give me entangled photons? So I want them to have this cat-like -like property. Where do I see that in, in the physics of these cartoons? Well, here's my ultraviolet photon coming into this nonlinear uh, crystal, and it's going to give me two photons out, which I'll from now on call them A and B. And uh, the thing about this crystal, it has one particular, it has many properties, but one key property is that it has to conserve momentum. And all this means in terms of uh, 
how the physics works is that you need to draw a triangle. So if this arrow, this bluish arrow, represents the momentum of the light coming in, then the momentum of the two photons must add up to it. And that means that you must draw a triangle where the arrow of the pump, which is what we call the incoming photon, must, if you draw these two arrows, they must go head to tail and complete the triangle. And you can see that there's many ways I could com complete this triangle. This is one example, but I could make the angles much steeper, you know, by making that much larger and that one larger, or I could make it much shallower, you know, many, many ways. If I do it like this, it means that photon A is at a particular angle and photon B is at a particular angle, just like I've drawn in this cartoon. And if I look on a camera, I see this sort of band of lights, and it means that my two photons will appear, for example, here. They could also appear in this point and that point, because these two angles would also complete the triangle, as would these two angles and these two angles. So in fact, all these possibilities exist in the experiment. But I could, for example, complete the triangle by collapsing it. This is like a triangle without any apex to it. And so now the two photons add up exactly to the pump. They are going at the same angle. Notice that the length of the two arrows are the same. The length of the arrow tells you the color of the light. So in this case, the light, the photons that are coming out of this crystal have exactly the same color. And now if I look on a camera, they will all be going in a, like a blob of light. And if I look in the middle, I will find these two entangled photons. Of course, in the real world, um, it's not as quite as simple as that. But if you have done a little bit of physics, I'll show you just one equation. Physicists can't give slides without equations. So here's another way of drawing triangles. This is how physicists draw triangles. Okay? So what we say is, and actually you only need uh, primary school mathematics to handle this. No, it's true. So, so it goes like this, right? This is the momentum of photon A, and that's momentum of photon B, but it's the pump minus it. So look, look here's, here's the case. Let's say that the, the length of the pump arrow is 10 units. So this is 10 units. And let's say photon A had one unit. Well, if this is one, then B must be 10 minus one, which is nine. So that's one and nine. That's one possibility. But it could also be that photon A had two units. So then if that's two, then 10 minus two must be what photon B is. So it's eight. So if one is two, then that is eight. Three and seven and so on. And if you look at this equation, the theoreticians and actually the two gentlemen who run this whole science of cocktails are theoreticians, they will immediately say, ah, that's an entangled state. So that's why we think that this nonlinear crystal will give us entangled photons, because the process of conserving momentum is precisely the same process as what you need in order to get entanglement in the first place. It's this ability that you have many, many outcomes but nature can't really distinguish between them. Like the cat being in two possible states, and you can't distinguish those states until you make the measurements. So this tells us that theoretically we believe that the system ought to give us entanglement. Of course, we don't work in a cartoon world. We work in the real world. And so this is what it looks like in the lab. Y you find two good students. You owe me a beer for saying that you're good, Bienvenue. And you give them an ultraviolet laser. Uh, you meant to wait a day, but typically you wait many months before they master all the, all the tricks. But basically, they, they send the ultraviolet laser through the crystal. In this case, we have a beam splitter, but you can see in the long exposure that there's two parts of the photons. In this case, it's all illuminated by the pump lights. So the two photons here, you don't see them because they're single photons but it shows you the path, and so you have your two photons going off in different paths, and you make your detections. So how do you know, now that you've set up the experiment and you believe everything works, how do you know that you really have got entangled photons? That's another way of saying, how do you know that the cat really is 
both dead and alive at the same time. How do you? Because that's when the box is closed. When you open it, it's in one of the two states. How do you know it wasn't always like that? So there is actually a test that you can do to tell those two worlds apart. And Elaine Aspect did this experiment about 35 years ago. And the test is extremely simple. He didn't do it on cats, all right? He also did it with photons. And what he does is the following. So remember, you have this crystal. He didn't actually use a crystal. He used a decay in an atom. But it doesn't matter how you generate it. You have two photons, and you send one off to that end of the room, and you send the other photon to the opposite end. And then you ask a very simple question. The, the people in statistics would call it a conditional probability. You say, imagine that I made a particular measurement on this photon, photon A. What's the chance that I would be able to measure something different on photon B? And so you make a set measurement over here, and you make a range of measurements on the other photon. And you say, what's the chance that I can, I can get detections under these conditions? Well, it turns out that if you look at the chance of making a detection, given that you're changing something on the one photon, you change what you're measuring, if the detection probability oscillates around the quarter mark, it never goes to zero and it never goes to a half, then everything is purely classical. That means the cat is, is either dead or it's alive. There, it was never in this mixed state. But if when you do this experiment, you see that the oscillation of this detection goes from zero to a half, which is a very different visually looking graph, then you know that you're clearly in the quantum world. The cat is both dead and alive at the same time. And when Elaine Aspect did this experiment, with his two photons coming out from an, from an atom. He got a graph like this. Well, it doesn't quite go down to zero because there's some experimental uncertainties and so on. But I think that you would agree that this curve, which goes from naught to a half, more or less, is very close to this one, and certainly nothing like that one. And so this, in his case, was a clear indication that he had entangled light. So we can do the same thing in our lab now, but um, and now we come into the measurement part of the three steps. But we don't want to measure, as he did, polarization of light. We want to have arbitrary measurements. And so what we do is we have two holograms. We send our two photons to two holograms. And the details of those holograms are not important for this talk, but they allow us to change what we measure on these two photons. And so I can set the measurement on the one hologram, say on photon A, and I can change what I measure on photon B. And I can also do an experiment just like Elaine Aspect did. And if you look at these, there are many, many curves on this plot, but you see that, that uh, the oscillation goes from a half down to zero, back and forward many, many times. And so this means that you're very clearly in the quantum world. And in fact, you can quantify just how much just how quantum is it really? And it turns out that you can, you can work out a number from this graph, and if, if this number is bigger than 2, then it's a quantum uh, phenomenon. And this number exceeds 2 by what we call 15 standard deviations, which means we definitely are in the quantum world. So we have entangled photons, and we can verify that entanglement. But this is not a talk about entanglement. It's a talk about imaging. So what can we do? on the imaging side. So <clears throat> remember I said that in the standard imaging world, we set up correlations by building an optical system that at particular planes, all points on this plane mapped to very particular points on the other plane. So this gave us these correlations. Now I've explained to you that in fact, in this science experiment, we have these momentum correlations because momentum is conserved. So I could draw the triangle like I showed you before for photon A and B. It turns out that in the optical world, it's very, very easy to go from momentum to position because, in fact, in the, in the world of physics, momentum of light is really just related to its color and its angle. And so if I want to look at two different momenta, which would mean two different angles of these photons, then if I go through a lens again, then this ray, which is at a particular angle, 
lenses map that to a particular position. That's what lenses do. They map angles to positions. And if I go in at a different angle, it maps to a different position. So in fact, a lens maps angles to positions, or it, la it maps momentum to position. And so if my system has got momentum correlations, it must also have position correlations, and vice versa. And so what this means, if I go to the little animation to follow now, it means that my nonlinear crystal, by creating photons that are entangled, automatically, through nature, have the position correlations that I want. And so I can now look at the two photons, A and B, and I can uh, generate photons from my nonlinear crystal, and they will appear at different places in arm A and arm B, depending on the momentum. But these positions are going to be correlated with one another. Now, correlated is a rather fancy term. So let's now look at a real experiment to explain what we mean by this. So here's an experiment. So imagine that I have the crystal over here, and I generate these two photons, and again I'm going to send one to the left part of the room, and one to the people that I'm terribly neglecting on the right part of the room. <clears throat> okay, so these two photons have position correlations from the crystal, but otherwise they are, you know, they're going in different directions, they are in a certain sense independent photons. That's not strictly true because they are entangled, but they're going in different directions. And now what I'm going to do is on arm A, I'm going to put an object, something that I'd like to form an image of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of glass, and with my black cokey, I'm going to color in all the parts black that I don't want light to get through, and leave the white part where light can get through. Okay. So if I were to shine a torch on this little ghost, then I would see a image of the ghost on the wall. But in this arm, where this one photon is going to experience the object, I'm going to put a very large detector, bigger than the object. We call it a bucket detector. So what happens? If light gets through this object, because the detector is bigger than the object, it doesn't know anything about the shape. This could be a ghost, it could be an a letter A, it could be a circle. It has no idea. It only knows, yes, I got a photon. No, I didn't. Yes, I got one. No, I didn't. It doesn't know anything about the shape of the object. So in arm A, it knows nothing about the shape of the object, but the object at least is there. And that's over there, let's say. Now the other photon doesn't see the object. It's never interacted with the object. It doesn't know anything about it. It goes to this end of the room, and then I say, put a camera over there. So you can either have a scanning detector or a camera, and I want you to measure and see what you see. So, so here on this arm I've got the object, this arm I've got no object. These two photons started at the same place, but they're going in completely opposite directions. And this one doesn't know anything about what the object is because the detector's too big. And here I've got a camera which can see exactly what there is there, but there's no object. So what will happen? Well, <clears throat> if I only did the experiment like that, I wouldn't see anything. But because nature gives me the position correlations, I can measure in coincidence, which means I can pick out all the entangled photons. And if the entangled, pho the entangled photons have what I need naturally from nature, it means that I should have the ability, even though this photon never sees the object, because it's position correlated with the other one, I should be able to image something that it's never seen. And if I do this experiment on an ICCD camera, and now I'm collecting many, many photons over some time, then what you see is that this photon, which has never passed through the object, eventually forms an image of that object. In this case, a little picture of a ghost. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting about this experiment and why it's called ghost imaging is that neither arm by itself knows anything about the object, 
but the two arms together allow you to image something. <clears throat> and of course, we can do what we did before. We can insert a lens into the system, and the lens will convert all the positions back into momentum, and that means that we get exactly the same ghost image, but the image is simply inverted. All right. So what's happened in this experiment that's different to what I showed you in slide number one? In slide number one, if we had an object over here and I wanted an image over there, then light would have to travel from this object all the way to the detector in the image plane. But in this experiment, the photon that saw the object never travels back to the detector, and so this photon, there's no light going from the object through to the image. <clears throat> they are completely independent arms. And so this idea that we have to have interaction between the objects and to form an image is no longer necessary. We can remove it. So that only leaves the dimensionality issue. Is it possible to get rid of this issue of having a two-dimensional detector in order with many, 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 many pixels in order to see something uh, that also has high resolution. Can we, can we get rid of that? And the answer is we can by playing a mathematical trick. So you know when you watch these uh, like CSI type movies and they're scanning through lots of uh, fingerprints in order to identify who the murderer is and so they have this algorithm and they're showing all the things running and finally there's a match. Well the idea there is that you have some something that you're trying to analyze, let's call it uh, our object, and you compare it against a bunch of unique outcomes, in this case, other people's fingerprints. And you keep saying, are you similar to this, yes or no? No, okay, are you similar to this one, yes or no? Until you find the correct one. In that case, there's only a one-to-one -one correspondence. But we can form, instead of fingerprints, other patterns, where we can say, I have this object, how similar are you, say, to this pattern? And then the answer might be, well, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit similar, 10% similar. So, okay, great. And so we'd get a number for, of 10% over there. And then we'll say, what about the next one? How, how similar are you to this one? And then the answer might be, well, I'm nothing like that, zero. So, okay, all right, so that's zero. And so you keep going, comparing what you have to all these different pictures, and then if you weight up all the outcomes, like how similar are you in each case, and you add up the sum, so all you have to do is add up the series, then you can reconstruct the thing that you were looking to study in the first place. And mathematically, the only thing you need to do to make sure that you have in the system is what we call orthogonality. And that's just a fancy way of saying that the sequence of patterns that you're going to use make sure that they themselves have nothing in common. So if you compare two patterns that are different, then they must have nothing in common. The answer must be naught. But if you take, obviously, two identical patterns, they have everything in common, and so the answer is one. As long as they have this property, then you can add up the sum on the right-hand side, and because of the equal sign, if you can just add up all these little numbers multiplied by the patterns that you chose, then you can build up the unknown thing on the, on the left. So this is a standard trick to study functions, not usually used in the context of imaging. So what has it got to do with imaging? Well, we can think of the camera's detector as working in a similar way. So let me show it to you like this. So here on the left, I now have a pixelated detector, like your camera. Your camera has got about a million or so pixels. And this is meant to represent the million or so pixels. Well, I could think of it like this, that the first pattern could just be how much light arrives at pixel number one, the pixel on, say, the top left corner. And then the next one is, well, how much light arrives at uh, the pixel on the bottom right corner? And of course, the pixel this pattern, which represents the pixel at the top left, has got nothing in common with the one that's the pixel at the bottom right. Well, that's how cameras work, right? I mean, we don't want the pixels to get confused with one another. We want their signal to be their signal and have nothing to do with the other signals. And so 
This is a way to deconstruct a pixelated detector into many, many patterns, each one with just one pixel. And again, they observe this property of orthogonality. That means that if I were to scan with one pixel over the whole thing, I could reconstruct, of course, my object. Well, that's fine, but of course, we don't really want to scan one pixel across the whole system. That would take a very long time. And so there's another way to make sure that we have this thing of nothing in common without having to only have one pixel per pattern, and that is that we could have a random pattern of pixels. So if I took a random selection of on-off patterns, and if it was truly random with uh, a certain level of sparsity, then it would be true that if you compare two completely random patterns, they would have nothing in common, and if you compare two patterns that are identical, then they would have everything in common. And so if I were to illuminate or break my object up into all these random patterns, then if I could only measure these numbers in front, I would simply have to add up the sum, and I could reconstruct whatever it was I was trying to look at. So let's say, for example, the letter J. And so that's what we do. We go back to our experiment, <clears throat> our ghost imaging experiment with our two entangled photons. And this time, instead of putting a camera in the one arm, as we did before, what we're going to do is we're going to have a single pixel detector. We still have the bucket detector in the other arm. So this one is still much bigger than the object that we're looking at. We have got no idea what the object is. But in the other arm, we're going to have a single pixel detector. It has no resolution whatsoever. But we want to see something that's got spatial resolution. And so to do that, we're going to scan on our hologram all these random patterns and simply measure for each one what is the coefficient. How similar are you to this particular pattern and add them up. And so this is what it looks like in the lab. We have the object. It's the J. And now we are running these random patterns. And for each pattern, we measure in our little single pixel how much light or how many photons arrive there. And we change the pattern and we measure again and we change the pattern we measure again and so on until we have done many, many patterns. We add up the sequence and as we add up the sequence you can see that an image, a ghost image of this object starts to appear. In this case you see it takes about 10,000 scans before we get something that starts to resemble the object. You can actually speed this up by about a factor of 10 by playing some clever uh, imaging tricks. And finally, you can get something like this. So it's a J after about 1,000 scans, and it shows very close resemblance again to our object. And the interesting thing here is that the object has got a two-dimensional structure to it, but the detector doesn't have any two-dimensional resolution but still, in the image, we can reconstruct a 2D image. So now we have ghost imaging in a way that we have no interaction from the object to the image, and we have no resolution on our, on our detector, but still we can see a resolved image of the object. In fact, you can generalize this, going back to the patterns that I showed you before. So instead of using these uh, complicated on-off type patterns, random patterns. I can choose any pattern sequence I like as long as it obeys this rule. <clears throat> and if I do that, I can start to image very complicated things. So rather than letters J, for example, these are particular structured modes of single photons. And the solid curve represents what we expect it to be. And the data points show you what it really is. And so you see that, again, we can get very resolved images, even though the detector doesn't have this resolution. But there's something else one can do that you cannot do very easily in a, convention, a conventional imaging system. So in a conventional imaging system, what we see is the intensity of the light, how much light is there. So let's say my object was this. So once again, I've taken a let's say a glass sheet, and with my black cokey, I color out everywhere 
except for this disk that's white. That means I'm going to let light through here, but I'm not going to let light through anywhere else. That's fine if I did an image of this conventionally or with normal ghost imaging. I would see a disk of light. Nothing very spectacular. But I'm going to do something a little bit different now. Inside the disk, I'm going to place some information that you can't see by just looking if there is light or if there's not light. So this hidden information, this hidden structure, is going to look like this. So I'm going to give, it's actually a phase change, but you don't have to worry about the details of that. It's something that you cannot detect by simply looking at how much light there is. And so I'm going to give these bands of phase changes. For example, the bottom one goes from white to black in one spiral, and then inside that, there's a layer that goes from white to black in three spirals, and then inside that, there's a layer that goes from white to black in five spirals, and then finally, the inner one, I'm not going to give any uh, spiral at all. So this is information sitting inside my disk that you wouldn't be able to detect just by an on-off signal. But this idea of reconstructing with patterns, because of the equality sign over here, means that every aspect of the thing on the left must be able to be found by adding up the things on the right. Not just how much light there is, but any physical property of the system. And so I should be able to see these inner spirals. And indeed, if I were to look at the photon counts at different parts of this ring, I see, in fact, that there's some change. And when I map this through, I get a measurement inside the circle that shows me this hidden information. It shows me the phase information that sits inside the disk. And if you look at the experiment, you can see that just like what we programmed to go from white to black in one spiral, the outer ring goes from white to black in one spiral. And just like we programmed to go three times around on the next spiral, you see that it goes three times around in the inner one, and so on. And so we can find hidden information inside our objects. Now, <clears throat> sometimes, uh, actually I don't give many ghost imaging talks, but, but people do sometimes say to me, why bother with all this quantum stuff? Because I know that it's, it's really, it's, well, we think it's really sexy. Okay? We think it's, it's great stuff and it's lots of fun. and It is, re actually. But, but what's the advantage? Because you're dealing with single photons, so it's really hard and it takes a long time. And Okay, so it's, it's quite nifty, but is there anything that you couldn't have done with a normal classical imaging case? And there are some things you can do that would not be possible in the classical world. So let me give you a couple of examples. So here's one from my collaborator, Miles Padgett in Glasgow. Actually, some of the fancy animations were from him. And so remember I told you that if you wanted to uh, model what's going on with these entangled photons in the crystal, you just have to draw a triangle. So here was the pump light. It's the little ultraviolet or the blue arrow and I make two photons of the same length, the, the arrows are the same, that means that they have the same color. So if the photon A was a red photon, photon B is also a red photon. But actually, there are many, many ways to draw the triangle, and another way to do it is to make the lengths of those arrows not the same. So I could make, for example, photon A's arrow much shorter than photon B. This means that photon A will have a different color to photon B. So if I go back to my big picture of the ghost imaging, it means that the one photon, for example, could be a visible photon, and the other photon could be an infrared photon. They don't have to be the same. Now you have to remember that the one photon is going to the object, and the other one's going to the detector. So why would you bother having photons of two different colors or two different wavelengths. Well, you know when you watch these science fiction movies, if they want to show you that they can see thermal imaging and things at night, then the people always put on these fancy goggles and they see like the heat image of the person. 
that's seen in the infrared. It's really hard to see in the infrared. You need very fancy detectors. They're very expensive. Very, very often they have to be cooled down to very, very low temperatures. So it's hard to work there. On the other hand, visible detectors, well, they sit in your smartphones. They're very, very cheap. They're easy to use. You don't have to cool them. Wonderful. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have this night vision, but with our smartphones? So that's what this system is going to allow you to do, because <clears throat> if I put my object, the thing I want to measure, in the infrared arm, which only has a cheap bucket detector, so that's no problem, and then I form an image on a camera in the visible arm, it means I can see things that are invisible, but with a visible camera. And that's what Miles has done. So he's uh, built a system that goes, when your photon comes into your crystal, you get a blue photon out on the one side and an infrared photon on the other, and you send the infrared photon to the thing you want to study. And now Kevin's going to play a little movie for us. <clears throat> so this is what his camera system looks like. And now he's actually imaging uh, methane gas. But he's imaging it on a standard detector, a visible detector. So you can start to see things that would otherwise be invisible. And this, being able to do this, is only possible because of this idea of these, co these correlations at two different colors that nature gives you automatically from the system. So in our group, we are doing something a little bit more fundamental than that. <clears throat> That's a wonderful applied project, and, I, and I'm sure many people are going to be very interested in that. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take imaging one step further. So these correlations all came from the crystal, but both photons originated from the same point. So remember I had my piece of glass here, and I sent one photon to that end of the room and one photon to the other. Now I want to do a different experiment. I'd like to imagine that there is somebody already on that side of the room, and I'm going to give them a torch and an object. I'm going to say, look, I want you to shine the torch through the object you know, onto the detector. Right? Happy? Good. And then I'm going to come to this side of the room and give somebody here a torch and say, uh, won't you shine that onto the camera and see what you see? Now, in that case, I do not have two photons going to opposite ends of the room. I have two completely independent sources of light. They have nothing to do with one another. And I would like to set this up and say, is it possible? So here it is in cartoon form. Uh, this person is sending some information of an object to the satellites. And I would like the person on the other, other satellites over here to be able to measure an image of what that person saw, even though there is no link between the two satellites and the two photons are completely independent. In fact, this link can be arbitrarily far apart and it doesn't have to be line of sight. So they could be opposite ends of the, of the planet and in the, in the optical world, if you don't have line of sight, if you can't see the thing that you want to talk to, then you can't talk to it. So let's imagine that it would not even be possible with conventional communication systems to relay any information between them. So there's no communication between them, but I would like this person to see the object and that person to find an image of it. So obviously, I hope it's obvious, you, you can't make it work like that. If that person's got a torch and this person's got a torch, you can't f transfer information across if there's nothing at all that links them. But because I told you earlier about entangled photons and they always come in pairs, it means that this person could actually make one of these photons have a pair and likewise from source number two would come in a pair and I could send each photon of the pair to a joint place. And all I have to do now is some measurement over here where these two photons overlap so that the independent photons become correlated. And what should that measurement be? So it's very, very seldom that nature plays along with our hopes and goals. Uh, usually nature never does that. 
But in this case, the measurement that we need in the middle in order to get things correlated is just a cube of glass. That's all. So if I just get this nice little cube of glass and I bring the two photons into it and I make a measurement on the other side, that's enough to get these two independent photons correlated. And as soon, in fact, not only correlated, but entangled. And so as soon as they are entangled, I can start to do my ghost imaging, but this time remotely with independent photons. So back to the cartoon world, this is what the experiment looks like because it's a little bit more illustrative than the real experiments. It's very similar to the cartoons I showed you before. If you have a look at the little inset at the bottom over here, then you see that I've got this time two crystals because I want four photons. I'm interested in photon A and photon D. So photon A is going to, for example, have the objects, and I hope to see an image in photon D. And uh, I'm going to take one photon from each pair, so one from this crystal and one from that crystal, B and C. And I'm going to take them to my little cube of glass, and I'm just going to detect them, that's all. And if I detect them, what will happen is that photon A, which previously was independent to photon D, will now become entangled with photon D. And with the entanglement, I can program on, on this hologram, an object, and this one measure an image. So because I have my little holograms in the arms again. And so Nicholas has been doing some calculations on this to see what happens, because we always like to model things before we actually do experiments. And so here he's got two objects, one of them is a cross, and the other one is an H. And you see that as the thing runs, we can form an image of the object with these independent photons. It's a little bit noisy, and I put teleportation in inverted commas because, strictly speaking, it's not perfect teleportation, but it's close. It's perfect in what we call low dimensions, but it's not perfect in high dimensions. So we get a little bit of noise, because we have some mixed states. But something very peculiar happens. So although it's a little bit noisy, you can certainly recognize the image from the object. You can see the, the, the plus sign, and you can see the H coming through in both cases. But it turns out <coughs> that how I do the measurement at this piece of glass plays a very large role in what sort of image I see. So usually, in all of our everyday experiences, in fact, even in our experiences in the lab, whenever we form images of objects, it's always a like for like. If I had uh, you know, my black cokey and I didn't let light through, then on the image I also don't get light there, and where I did let light through, I, I get light in my image. So that's why I see a, if that's got a plus, in the object, I see a plus in the image. But if you look at this sequence of calculations, it's doing exactly the opposite. So we call this contrast inversion, and what it means is that in this particular system, if I have an object that lets some light through in some place, in the image I see no light there. And where it blocks the light, I suddenly find light. It completely flips the, the contrast from light to no light, no light to light. And that's a very, very strange feature. <clears throat> in fact, it's never been seen in, in an imaging system like this before. And so we think this is all true, and so we say appears, because as scientists we like to be very careful in what we say, and so this is still very preliminary studies. We're not sure if it's true or not, we believe it's true because the theory says it's true. And the early experiments, and here you see some, indicate that it is true. And it turns out, what we think anyway, is that it's due to the flavor of the entanglement. So entanglement, I've been talking about it as if there's only one type. But actually it comes in different flavors. And two of the flavors that you get is called symmetric and anti-symmetric. And it turns out that if you do symmetric imaging, which everybody has done up to now, you see the usual story. If you have a J, you see a J. If you have light inside it, you see light inside the image. But if you do it with the anti-symmetric case, it gets inverted in its contrast. So that's very exciting. 
And to come back then to the concluding remark, so can we teleport an image of an object across a virtual link? Well, the preliminary experiment seems to say yes. So here's the object that the person over there shone on with their torch. It had some light in one quadrant at the top left and no light everywhere else. <clears throat> and we find that in the other arm on the independent photon, we have no lights where we did have lights and light everywhere else. And so that is a, a very strange result, but, uh, but shows that we can teleport images of objects. I actually tried to explain this to my daughter, <coughs> who is 12 years old, and I told her it's like Star Trek, because she's a science fiction fan. I said, you know, in Star Trek, uh, Scotty beams people up, like he teleports the people. So I said, well, we can't teleport people just yet, but we can send an image of the person. And she said, well, that's not very impressive. <coughs> so we can't send the person, but we can send an image, um, and maybe in the future we'll come back and talk about teleporting the whole person. So to conclude then, um, this has all been a, a group activity. My students do most of these. Actually, they do all of these experiments. I, I don't do very many these days. And this is a snapshot of, of the team as we took it a few days ago. <coughs> What I've shown you today is a lot of our work. I did highlight a little bit of the work at the University of Glasgow, who we collaborate very closely with. But if you find the topic interesting, you can go and Google ghost imaging. It's been around for about 20 years at least or so. There are many, many groups around the world working on it. We're certainly not the only ones. And you'll find a very, very nice popular article written by Miles, who did the nice uh, uh, visible infrared imaging that explains the basics in very layman's terms. So this is an exciting field and we something we are pursuing within our group. And so uh, since it's nearly time for the cocktails, I think I'll wrap it up and say um, thank you for listening. <laughs>